Selamat pagi from Jakarta and good morning from Singapore. Come some Nida and CSCA, everyone for joining us in today's excite, uh, exciting event. Uh, today we had more than 3,000 people actually who have registered for the, uh, for the uh, session today. Uh, lots of ELT friends and colleagues from East Asia, from Thailand, the Philippines, China, uh, and many other places in the region. So here you go, a very warm welcome to all of you uh, in the audience. My name is Willy Renandia, and I'm honored to be assisting British Council uh, Indonesia in organizing a series of webinars with the broad theme of English language teaching today, opportunities and challenges. We have had two very successful sessions uh, this month. Uh, the, the very first uh, webinar in the series was uh, teaching multimodal literacy with speakers from Singapore and Korea. And the second one was also equally successful. We had two speakers, one from Singapore and one from Japan. And the topic was very exciting as well, extensive reading and extensive uh, listening. And today is a very special day because the topic is so dear to many of you, to me and to many people here in the audience, task-based and project-based learning in English language teaching. And we have very, very good speakers, excellent speakers today, Professor Rob Ellis and also Professor Francisca Yvonne. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before we start, a uh, couple of housekeeping matters. The uh, session is being recorded and live streamed on the British Council uh, website. And uh, at the end of today's session, you will be able to collect your e-certificate. But before you do that, before you collect your e-certificate, I think you will need to fill in uh, the uh, evaluation form for today's session. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let me invite my co-moderator, Professor Nguyen Thi Thuy Ming from Otago University, to introduce the first speaker, Professor Rob Ellis. Hello, Over everyone. You, <laughs> Thank you, Willie. Hello, everyone. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our very first speaker today, who is very well known to all of us in TESO in Applied Linguistics, Professor Rod Ellis. Professor Rod Ellis is a distinguished research professor in Curtin University in Australia, a long-standing professor at Anaheim University, visiting professor at Shanghai International Study University, and America's distinguished professor at the University of Auckland. He is also a fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand. Professor Ellis has written extensively on second language acquisition and thus based language teaching. And his most recent co-author book is Thus Based Language Teaching, Theory and Practice, published in 2020 by Cambridge, um, Cambridge University Press. Um, today, we're very honored to have Professor Rod Ellis as our guest speaker and he will talk about using tasks in language teaching. Please join me in welcome Professor Rod Ellis. Over to you, Rod. Your audio, Rod. Okay. And how do I get my PowerPoint up? Do I need to share my screen again? Yes. Okay. Well, um, I'm also honored to be given this opportunity to talk to you uh, on using tasks in language teaching. Uh, you will see that I work at Curtin University in Perth, Australia, but in fact, I am not in Perth, Australia. I am in Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, I actually work online uh, for Curtin University now. Okay. All right, this is an outline of my talk. Um, first of all, if we are to understand what task-based language teaching is, it's crucially important that we have a very clear idea of what is a task and also what is not a task. 
because task-based language teaching is an approach that is based uh, on the uses on the use of tasks, not non-task type activities. I'm then going to be talking about two ways of using tasks in language teaching. Um, what we call task-based language teaching and what we call task-supported language teaching. And then I'm going to say just a very few things about evaluating a task and then some final comments. Now, I should warn you that during my talk, I'm actually going to do a task with you. Um, it's a listening task, so I'm sure Willie will be very pleased to hear that. Um, in order to do this task, you will need a piece of paper and a pen. That's all you need, a piece of paper and a pen and to listen. Okay, let's get started. What is a task? Uh, I have a fairly standard definition of a task, uh, which is being kind of broadly accepted by people working in task-based language teaching. And it says that for a, an activity to be called a task, it must satisfy four criteria. There must be a primary focus on meaning, not a primary focus on form. In other words, the activity must involve understanding and making meaning, not on trying to learn a particular form. Uh, there has to be some kind of gap, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, the third criterion is, in my opinion, one of the most important, and that is that you do not pre-teach the language that you want learners to use, that the task requires participants to use their own linguistic and non-linguistic resources uh, in order to complete the task. Uh, these, these resources could include a dictionary, so they could look up words in a dictionary in order to do a particular task, non-linguistic, gesture, facial expression, etc. And the fourth task has a very clearly defined communicative outcome. Uh, the outcome, therefore, is determined in terms of whether you have successfully or not successfully achieved it. And you'll see what that means when you do the task in a moment. Here is the task. Um, it's a map task, and it's a very, very simple one. Uh, it basically involves listening to the teacher's description of an island. And you can see an outline of the island there. And the teacher is going to describe where these different places are on the island. And then you have to write the names in, in the correct position. Okay. Now, one thing about the uh, island, you will see that it actually looks a little bit like a human face. And that's important because when I give a description, I will be using words about the human face. So in order to do this task, I want you please to draw the outline of the island, if you would. Please draw the outline of the island. And I'm just going to give you one minute to do that. You don't have to be a brilliant artist to do this. Just please get the basic outline and the main features there. Okay, I hope you're all ready. Let's get started. Betu. Betu is the main town on the island and it is situated on the nose of the island. Uh, about where the nostril of the nose is. So um, could you please draw in Betu? Songa is a smaller town and it is on the other side of the island uh, under the ear of the island. Under the ear, you will see that there is an inlet from the sea and Songa is situated at the end of that inlet. Please write in Songa in the correct place. Bottomless Bay. Bottomless Bay is the name of the bay on which Betu is situated. So in other words, it's under the nose of the island. 
right in bottomless bay. Mataka is um, really just a village uh, situated in the jungle and it's in the neck of the island, but it's not on the coast. It's a little bit inland from the coast, situated in the middle of the neck of the island, right in Mataka. Okay, now you must listen very, very carefully. First of all, the river Ironga. The river Ilonga, uh, Ironga starts at the top of the island on your map, uh, on the left side, and it runs down the island through Songa into the inlet on which Songa is situated. Now that was a bit complicated, so maybe I'll just say it again. Okay. Um, the river Ironga is situated, um, it's a river that runs from the top of the island uh, on the right side of the top of the island, down the island, through Songa into the inlet on which Songa is situated. And now the river Ilonga that is situated on the other side of the island. So it starts on the left at the top of the island and it runs down that side of the island through Betu into Bottomless Bay. So could you draw in those two rivers, please? And now finally, we have Iluba Mountains. And the Iluba Mountains are a mountain range that runs across the top of the island, really where the forehead of the island is. And it runs along the top, but it does not run down to the coast on either side. So along the top, but it doesn't go all the way down to the, toast, the coast on either side. Okay. Now, how well have you done? You can check yourself. Here we go. Now, I, I have to admit I made a mistake. I actually um, gave the wrong information for the two rivers because I said that the river Ironga started on the right side of the mountains and ran through Songa. And you can see that I should have said river Ilonga. So you might want to correct that if you put river Ironga running through Songa, then you're correct. And the river Ilonga is the one that starts on the other side of the Aluba Mountains and runs through Betu. Okay, now how well, how well have you done? To what extent are you, have you been successful in doing this particular task? Well, actually there are seven places. So in a way you can give yourself seven marks, uh, one mark for uh, each place that you put in the correct position on the map. Now I've done this task with many people and um, it varies enormously. Some people are really good at this and get seven out of seven, but other people actually only get three or four out of seven. So you can evaluate the extent to which you have been successful in doing this particular task. <clears throat> Is it a task? Well, I think very clearly it's a task because the main focus is on meaning, and in, in this case, understanding my directions. Um, there's a gap. I knew where all these places were situated. You didn't, so there was an information gap. You had to use your own linguistic resources to understand my descriptions of where these different places are located. And there is a communicative outcome. And the communicative outcome is in front of you now. It's the map with all those different places written on it, okay? So that is a task. In this next slide, I really um, repeat again 
the four criteria for a task. And then I show how the criteria for an exercise differ from the criteria for a task. So an exercise has a primary focus on using language correctly, on form, not meaning. In an exercise, there's no gap. An exercise is text manipulating. Uh, a classic uh, exercise are sentences with gaps in them, and you have to complete the gaps in the sentences, et cetera. So you're given a text, and you just have to manipulate it by filling in the missing words. And the successful performance is whether you have used the target feature, the feature that is the target of the exercise, accurately or not. So you see this fundamental difference between a task and an exercise. Now, what I want to do is to pursue this difference a little bit more by showing you some examples of tasks and exercises and getting you to think about whether it is a task or is an exercise. So here is the first one, going shopping. And this is what the students can see. They can see Mary's shopping list and a list of items that Mary wants to buy. And they can see Abdullah's store and a list of uh, items that are being sold in the store. And then the instructions are work with a partner. One person, one person is Mary and the other person is Mr. Abdullah. Make conversations like this. Good morning, do you have any? Yes, I have some. No, I don't have any. Okay. So task or exercise. And in order to decide, you've got to look at the criteria. Now, you might think this kind of looks like an exercise. Uh, sorry, this looks like a task. But in fact, I would consider it to be an exercise. Uh, the main focus is not actually on meaning, but on trying to use a particular grammatical structure correctly. Can you see what the grammatical structure is? It's the use of some and any in questions and in positive replies and in negative replies, et cetera. So it has a grammar focus. Is there a gap? No, because the students can see both the shopping list and the list of items in Abdullah's store. Do they have to use their own linguistic resources? No, they don't, because they're given a model and all they have to do is to repeat the model, et cetera. They don't really have to use their own language. And finally, is there a communicative outcome? No, there's no communicative outcome at all. The outcome is simply, have they actually produced the grammatical structure correctly or not? So it's an exercise. Now, what about this? What can you buy? Now, what you need to understand here is that the information has been split between two students, student A and student B. And student A can see Mary's shopping list, and student B can see the items in Abdullah's store. But they can't see each other's items. And they're given a very clear purpose about what they have to do. Uh, student A um, has to decide which items on the shopping list he or she can buy. And student B has to decide which items student A asks for that he or she does not stock, et cetera. So there's a very clear purpose. And if you go through my four criteria, you will see very clearly that this now is a task because there's a primary focus on meaning. The meaning is created by the purpose that each person has for doing the, the task. There's a gap because they can't see each other's information. They have to use their own linguistic resources. And there's a communicative outcome for student A and a different communicative outcome for student B, et cetera. Now, of course, when they do this task, they must use their own linguistic resources. And it is possible to do this task using extremely simple language. Um, the interaction between the student A and student B might be very simple. Um, 
Mary might simply say oranges, and the person who is Abdullah would say no. And Mary would say eggs, and Abdullah would say no. And Mary would say flour, and Abdullah would say, is that correct? Yes, etc. All right. So you might think, well, this is no good because they're using very simple language. But, you know, that's not so bad because it would actually get beginner level students communicating together, interacting together in a meaningful way, just simply using single words. And it is, of course, possible that when students do this task, they could use much fuller language. A person playing Mary, for example, would say, uh, good morning, how are you? Uh, I'm hoping you have some oranges today. Oh dear, I'm very sorry. I don't have any oranges today. In other words, the whole thing here is that students are free to use whatever linguistic resources they have, etc. So tasks can be done in different ways. The same task can involve very simple language, or it can involve learners in using much more complex language. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about types of tasks now. Uh, and you'll see here that I have uh, done this in terms of a number of binary distinctions. So the first binary distinction is whether it's a real life task or whether it's a pedagogic task. Uh, a real life task um, is a task that corresponds to uh, a task in real life. Uh, it matches um, a target task, something that they would have to do in the real world outside the classroom. And a pedagogic task is a task that still meets the four criteria, but doesn't really correspond to anything that they might have to do outside. So, for example, if you were using this task, what can you buy in Indonesia? Would you consider this to be a real life task or a pedagogic task? Now, to decide it was a real life task, you'd have to say, well, do people in English have to go into small stores and carry out conversations like the one that this task requires? And I think the answer would be clearly no. So it doesn't correspond to a real life task. It's a pedagogic task. It does involve using language in an authentic type way, but not in a situation that is really truly authentic for these learners. And one of the issues in task-based language teaching is the extent to which we should be trying to use real life tasks or whether it's okay to use pedagogic tasks. And I think the answer to that really depends on your teaching situation, that if your teaching situation is um, primary schools or high schools in Indonesia, or even universities in, in Indonesia, most of the tasks you use with your students would be pedagogic. Real life tasks become very important in second language situations. Because if we had a group of students that um, we were preparing to deal with everyday life in the United States or the United Kingdom or New Zealand, then we would have to ask, well, what are the real life tasks that they have to do in their daily life in these places, etc.? And then we would base our tasks on the target tasks that we've identified. The second distinction is between input-based and output-based tasks. Um, and I'm just going to go backwards and ask you whether you think the tasks that I've shown you so far are input-based or output-based. What about this one? What can you buy? Input-based or output-based? Output-based means speaking or writing. Input-based means reading or listening. Well, you should see immediately that this is an output-based task. What about my math task? Input-based or output-based? Well, you didn't need to say anything at all. 
all you had to do was to listen to me describe where these spaces are. So clearly input-based. Now this distinction between input-based and output-based is really very important because if you are dealing with beginner level learners or even with learners who have had quite a few English lessons but really have no fluency, no communicative ability, you would have to ask yourself, what kind of task should I start with, with this kind of student? And the answer I think would have to be input-based. Output-based tasks, are better to suit it to students who've already developed some ability to speak in English. Closed versus open tasks. Um, closed tasks are tasks where there is a fixed answer, a fixed communicative outcome. An open task is where there are many, many possible uh, outcomes to the task. And this is closely linked to another distinction between input base, sorry, between um, information gap tasks and opinion gap tasks. So once again, let's go back to the tasks I've shown you and you think about whether they are closed or open. This one, closed or open? Closed, because there is a definite communicative outcome for student A, a definite communicative outcome for student B. What about my map task? Closed, because there is a definite single communicative outcome, the one you can see uh, on the map with the places drawn in, et cetera. So the ones that I've shown you are all closed. So what about open tasks? Well, one of my favorite open tasks is what I call the heart transplant task, which I'm not going to show you. The heart transplant task involves giving students information about four people that need a heart transplant because they, their hearts are very ill, they're very sick, etc. And they are given information about each of these people, how old they are, their family situation, whether they smoke or don't smoke, etc. And the task that is set to the students is to discuss these four people and simply decide who they think is best suited to get the heart transplant. There's only one heart available, so they have to choose just one person for the heart transplant. Now, the way in which the information is organized is it's not straightforward. You can develop different arguments for different people. And so this is an open task because there is no really single fixed answer to doing the task. Here and now and there and then tasks. Uh, here and now tasks are tasks where um, people, uh, students can see the information that they need to use to do the task. And there and then tasks are tasks where they cannot see the information they may have read the information, they may have heard the information, but they can no longer see it when they actually come to do the task, et cetera. So again, let me go back. What can you buy? Here and now or there and then? Well, this is here and now because student A can see the shopping list and student B can see the list of items in Abdullah's store. So they don't have to remember the shopping list. They don't have to remember what's in the store. They can actually look and see. What about my map task? Here and now or there and then? Well, this is also a here and now because once you've drawn the map and you listen to the teacher, you can see the map and you can relate what you're hearing to the outline of the map, et cetera. Now this distinction is also important because it's one way of defining the difficulty of tasks. Here and now tasks are generally easier than there and then. I can give you an example of there and then, but if we go back to the heart transplant task and we give the students the information about the four people, what we could do is say, read the information, 
make quick notes about the information about the four people, and then you take away the actual texts describing the four people. So when they start to do the task, they're purely reliant on their notes. So that has become more like a there and then task, et cetera. Unfocused versus focused tasks. Uh, an unfocused task is a task which has not been designed with any particular language point in mind, no specific vocabulary in mind, no particular grammar point in mind. Focus tasks, on the other hand, are tasks that have been designed with um, particular grammar points in mind. And I think I have an example on the next slide. Yeah. Here is an example of a focused communicative task, right? Uh, it's an information gap task. Students are given information about four candidates for a job in a private EFL school, right? And they have to read the information and then they have to talk about the information and come to a decision about what, which of the four people, I'm only giving you information about two of them, which of the four people uh, should get the job. So it's an, it's a, uh, an opinion gap task, et cetera. Look carefully at the information that they're given about Jock and Betty, okay? Can you work out what the focus of this task is? Well, I hope you have done so. It's present perfect, because you can see that all the information that they have been given is information about the present perfect. Of course, when you are uh, using this task, you don't tell students that this is a task that is designed to practice um, the present perfect. You just create the task in such a way that there is an opportunity for students to use the particular grammatical focus, the target structure of the task, etc. cetera. Um, a focused task is directed at creating opportunities for learners to use some specific linguistic feature. So a focused task can make the use of the target fact feature useful, natural, or essential. It would be great if we could always design focused tasks that would make the use of a particular target structure essential. But it's very, very difficult to do that. Uh, if we look at the example of the task, if we don't tell the students that they've got to use the present perfect, they may use it or they may not use it when they're actually performing the task, right? It's up to them, right? They can use the information that they've given or they can use their own language because that's always possible in a task. So they may avoid using the actual target structure. Uh, so this task is certainly not making the use of the present perfect essential, but I think you could argue that it is actually making it useful and perhaps even natural to use the present perfect when you're doing this task. Designing focused tasks is actually quite difficult. Uh, it's easier to do for some structures like maybe present perfect, it's much more difficult to use for, to, do, uh, to design tasks for more complex structures, but possible with ingenuity. Going back to the last type, which is teacher-generated versus learner-generated. Teacher-generated is where the content of the task is um, given in the task materials. And learner generated is where learners have to fill in their own content. So uh, imagine that we had a picture description task. And let's say that we gave le learner, one learner, one student, uh, a picture and asked that learner to describe that picture so that another student could actually draw it. Okay. That would be teacher generated because you're giving them the picture, you're giving them the content that they have to deal with in the task. Learner generated is where 
we simply say, draw a picture about um, a dangerous moment that you experienced in your life, something that made you afraid. Draw a picture. And then you would say, okay, now describe your picture to your partner, et cetera. Now the content has come from the student. And I think I have another example here, which you can read, teacher generated versus learner generated. Well, actually this is the idea that I just, I just uh, given. Uh, this is, I think also an interesting idea um, because by and large, where possible and where we think learners have sufficient proficiency, I think there is a lot to be said for trying to develop tasks with learner-generated content rather than teacher-generated content. So suiting the task type to the learner. Uh, well, really, I've covered this already. One of the great big issues in task-based language teaching is uh, trying to ensure that you've got the task at the right level of difficulty for students. So what I'm doing on this slide is simply giving very broad ideas about what kinds of tasks are suitable for beginners, intermediate learners, advanced learners, and special purpose learners, et cetera. Okay, two ways of using tasks in language teaching. These two ways are referred to as task-supported language teaching and task-based language teaching. Task-supported language teaching is what you tend to find in a lot of modern textbooks uh, produced by publishers, et cetera. Uh, and really, task-supported language teaching is the same as PPP, the idea that you present a particular linguistic feature, usually a grammatical structure, you practice it using exercises, and then there's an opportunity for free production, and that's where the task would come in, right? So PPP is a kind of task-supported language teaching. And this is based on skill learning theory. Skill learning theory basically says that we start with declarative knowledge about, say, a grammatical structure, and then we practice it in a very controlled type of way. And then we are given the opportunity to try to use it more communicatively, and this helps us to develop procedural knowledge. To my mind, and also to a lot of people who support task-based language teaching, there are limitations of task-supported language teaching. It assumes a strong interface position. That is to say, it assumes that all knowledge of language starts with declarative or explicit knowledge, and then is practiced until it becomes implicit or procedural knowledge. The problem is that we know that the process of acquiring the grammar of a language is a very gradual incremental process. And it doesn't seem to me that the idea of teaching the language structure by structure, as in PPP, as in task supported language teaching, really matches what we know about this incremental, gradual process of language acquisition. The other problem is that even when they get to the final P, where they do a task to practice using the structure in free communication, it still doesn't really result in genuine communication. And it could be argued that this type of teaching is not useless. I certainly wouldn't want to say that, but perhaps it doesn't develop the real type of implicit knowledge that is needed to communicate freely, naturally, et cetera. And perhaps the final limitation is that, you know, grammar is just too complex to learn intentionally in this way. You can't master the grammar of a language structure by structure by structure by structure. You've got to work more holistically on many structures at a time, gradually developing greater accuracy in their use, gradually acquiring them. And task-based language teaching is what aims to do that. So what is task-based language teaching? So far, I've just been talking about tasks, but task-based language teaching uh, is, involves a little bit more. 
First of all, it means that you've got to have a syllabus. Any approach to language teaching requires a syllabus. So in task-based language teaching, the syllabus is a series of tasks sequenced according to difficulty. And I think it is possible to include a mixture of focused and unfocused tasks. And I do have some ideas about how that mixture, mixture ought to be organized, but I think that would require another talk. I don't have time today. Uh, Task-based language teaching involves selecting tasks, sequencing them, and then thinking carefully about how to implement them, how to actually teach them. And this leads us to the typical three phases of a task-based lesson, a pre-task phase, a main task phase, and a post-task phase. And I say here that in the pre-task phase, before learners start doing the task, you can perhaps provide opportunities to prepare the students to do the task, particularly perhaps by helping them with some useful vocabulary. Uh, and another key thing about the implementation of task-based teaching is what is called focus on form, which is where while learners are doing the task, we subtly try to direct their attention to linguistic form. So the primary focus stays on meaning, but this doesn't mean that during the performance of the task, there's no actual focus on form. Task-based language teaching caters to incidental acquisition. And by and large, I think most people would argue that if you're going to develop a very high level of proficiency in a language, the type of learning that you will need for that is going to be incidental language acquisition rather than intentional language learning, which is what you get in uh, task-supported language teaching. Um, incidental acquisition means two things. It means getting greater control over the language that you partially acquired, and it means acquiring new language. And task-based language teaching aims to do both. It aims to help learners get greater control over whatever they've already learned, but also to help them learn new language. And this is a quick slide about focus on form, but my time is nearly up. And so I think I probably need to move on. This is just a quick example of focus on form. A learner says he passes house while telling a story and so should be using past tense and the teacher subtly draws his attention to the use of the correct verb form past in a recast, but does it in a way that is compatible with a primary focus on meaning and trying to achieve the task outcome. I think there are a lot of advantages of task-based language teaching. It caters to learning incidentally, it, it facilitates learning through the simultaneous development of interactional competence. Uh, in other words, when learners are doing tasks, they are both learning language, acquiring language, but also learning how to use that language in communicative interaction. So they're developing their interactional competence at the same time as developing new language or increasing control over existing language. And to be absolutely honest, I think task-based language teaching really does help to develop intrinsic motivation. Uh, I've had a Indonesian student recently do a study where he was mentoring uh, a teacher in a secondary school, uh, introducing task-based language teaching. And one of the things that that study showed was the high level of intrinsic motivation that the students had to do the tasks. And the fourth reason is that a task-based approach enables teachers to see if students are developing the ability to communicate. In other types of language teaching, you don't really know whether students are improving their ability to communicate. But in task-based language teaching, you can actually see where the student's ability to do the tasks is gradually improving, et cetera. So you get feedback on whether your teaching is actually helping them with communicative ability. Um, I'm worried about time, and I don't really have time to deal 
effectively with this. So if you don't mind, Willie, I'm going to miss this out and say thank you very much for listening, right? Um, there is my final comments, and I'll leave this slide up so that you can just look at it. Mm. And I think I'm slightly over time, but not much. Thank you so much, Rod, um, for a very engaging and wonderful presentation. Um, it gave us so much valuable information on different types of tasks and how to use tasks in language teaching. Um, it's really, really great. Thank you. Not at all. So now, really, uh, my co-moderator will introduce the next speaker, and then we have Q&A at the end of the second presentation. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you very much again, Professor Rod Ellis. Very insightful presentation, as usual. I think we learned a lot from your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please give Professor Rod Ellis another big round of applause. And uh, if you have a lot of questions, if you have questions that you want to ask to Professor Ellis, uh, please put the questions in the Q&A box and uh, he'll, be, he'll be very happy to respond to your questions uh, that you may have about task-based language teaching. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives now a great pleasure to introduce to you the second uh, speaker. Uh, Professor Francisca Maria Yvonne teaches at the English department of Universitas Negeri Malang, uh, Indonesia. Uh, she did her undergraduate degree in the same university, and then she continued doing her postgraduate degrees in Australia. And the name of the university is University of Queensland uh, in Brisbane, where she got her master's and also her PhD in applied linguistics. Her research interests include technology-enhanced language learning, extensive listening and viewing. Hey, how come that's the same as mine? Extensive reading as well and uh, learner autonomy and collaborative learning. Her latest publication is a lovely, lovely chapter, bringing extensive listening uh, into the second language classroom that we co-authored together and published by uh, TSO uh, International. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Professor Francisca Maria Ivan. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I would like to thank British Council Indonesia for inviting me and also Paulir uh, Renandia. Now allow me to share my screen. So today I'll be talking about project work in the digital environment. First of all, we are going to take a look at what project-based language learning is and uh, the what, the why, and how we situate this project-based language learning in the area of digital uh, technology. So first of all, let's take a look at what PBL is. So I usually start this by looking into some definitions given by experts. Now, if we take a look at these definitions, we can see that project-based or project work or project-based language learning is a little bit more open-ended compared to task-based language learning. So we can see that this is a series of interconnected extended tasks that will last for a significant period of time. And when we have more time, then we will be able to add greater purpose to learning language learning as well as other skills that students can learn. So focus, the focus of pro, uh, project-based language learning is not only for completing tasks, but also for using language incompleting task. Now, let's take a look at another one. So we are uh, looking into keywords here. So once again, project-based language learning will take a long time to do, probably a week or two or even one semester. And in this particular definition given by Beckett, we can see that we can do both individual as well as cooperative or collaborative projects. And the next part of this definition gives us an idea that in project-based language learning, there are some, uh, some stages that learners will need to go through, like the planning, researching, reporting. And this appears again in another definition. So here, PBL involves tasks just as brainstorming, planning, exchanging opinions, discussing, editing, evaluating, and finalizing, and later on, reporting. So students will go through some stages 
in completing a project. In some cases, this is called like project work. So when we take a look at uh, the British Council website of the example of project work, you can have a very typical example here, a group of teenagers, uh, teenage, teenage learners work on a project to develop a series of posters on how to protect the environment. So there is an outcome and the students will need resources to finish this particular project. They need time, they need people around them to help them you know, learn new skills and use the language and also they need uh, other resources in the form of materials. When doing a project-based language learning or project work, learners will practice a range of skills, including language. Now, thinking about project-based language learning, first, students will use language in uh, some sort of authentic context. We will take a look at these keywords later on, one by one, not all of them, but the important ones. You know, these are words that came from many definitions given by experts in the area of uh, project-based language learning. Now, one which is not in the definitions is this one, mode, because when we are in this kind of situation like online learning mode, then modes will be very important to consider. Now, thinking about the roles now, in our typical language classrooms, usually teachers teach, students learn, and then technology support. Now, within the context of project-based language learning, teachers are playing more roles. So teachers are designers of the project uh, work. They facilitate learners in finishing the project. They motivate learners because projects take time to complete, and then learners will need to be motivated throughout the journey of completing the project. Sometimes teachers will also act like experts. So when students cannot do a certain kind of skill, then should, uh, teachers can fill that in or teachers can bring someone with the particular expertise. Teachers also act like advisors and supervisors because to, to be able to, to work uh, at a long period of time, you need someone to supervise. At the end of the project, teachers will be assessors. So let's take a look at the, the, the students' uh, roles in this kind of uh, context. So learners will use the target language, but they will also act like planner, negotiator, communicator, collaborator, researcher, decision maker, risk taker, autonomous learning uh, learners, as well as group mates if they work in group with other students. Technology in, uh, in project-based language learning will be used as medium of communication, can be used as sources of information, as tools, as well as tutors, when students need to find out about something and they, they can go to the um, internet and find out how to do things. Now, the next concept, which is very important in pop, uh, project this language learning is authenticity. So I borrow this concept from Willis and Willis. The first uh, level is at the meaning level, authenticity at the, uh, at the meaning level. The next is authenticity at discourse level. And the last one is authenticity uh, in the level of activity. Now let's take a look at each of these. So at the meaning level, Learners have the opportunity to produce meaning useful in real world. They use vocabulary related to the topic and should be useful in real world as well. They can express their opinion, preferences and ideas and feelings, and they use their own language. They sometimes are forced to stretch their language to negotiate meaning. Yeah, so this is the first level. Now, the next one, if you want to take language learning to a further continuum of authenticity, we need to give learners the opportunity to reach the discourse level. So they need the, the chance to practice common everyday life discourses. 
like expressing opinions or phrasing others, constructing arguments, agreeing and disagreeing with others, relating arguments uh, that others are produced with their own words and things like that. Now, the last Francesca, one is actually- Sorry, sorry yes? Francisca. I think you need to yes? stay away, a little bit away from your microphone. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of hissing sound there. Uh, it, yeah, there's right. a lot of echo oh. and- okay, Yeah, how's it now? It's, it's still- I cannot there. stay it's away still because on. it- Okay. I'll hold on a second. I cannot stay away from my microphone because it, I'm using like wireless uh, headsets now. Okay, is it any better? Uh, not really. Maybe maybe you shouldn't be using the headset. Okay. Because no one is speaking to you, right? Yeah. There'll be uh, outside noise, you know. Because oh, my yeah. next door neighbor is actually renovating their house, so the, the, the hissing sound is probably from from outside. Okay. okay, let's carry on. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry for that. Right. So the next level is at the activity level, authenticity at the uh, at activity level. So learners need to have the opportunity to perform meaningful activities that may occur in real life. They need to do pro uh, real life projects driven by real life questions. And in the process of doing this, they will also learn real life skills like improving their digital literacy, learning to collaborate with other people and so on. So in problem-based language learning, we want learning or learning experience to be relevant, meaningful, as well as useful. So we want them to be able to apply what they learn in class in real world, real world. and learning should be interesting and engaging and later on, when they do something else, learners may be able to transfer what they learn during their problem-based, uh, their project-based language learning. Now, uh, there's also an idea of, you know, should students do individual or group projects? Now, let's take a look at some of the uh, challenges of this. When doing individual projects, it is easier for teachers to assess later on, because you just assess students based on their individual uh, performance. Uh, it, you can give more personalized learning experience to, to that particular student, but there be students will not be communicating or collaborating with other people. So they are missing out on a lot of things actually. And when it comes to group work, it will be more challenging to assess because as teachers, we know that when students are in groups, we don't know who is contributing uh, to, the, the, to the project more and what they are actually doing within the project. Now, in group work, not everyone will be on the same base. So some people will take it lightly. Some people are more into doing project work and they know how to work with other people. This kind of, uh, group work is going to be harder to manage. And, but on the other side, when students are given the chance to work together, they will learn more skills, more skills that will be useful for them in the 21st, the 21st century. All right. Now, there's also the how to and the want to. When students work individually, it will be harder for them to cultivate the how to, it's the skills of uh, completing a project, but when they work in group, they will have the support of others. So for example, if one student cannot, uh, cannot edit a video, then another student can teach them how to do it. But when it comes to group work, the one to is more difficult because the drive is going to be very different from one student to another. Now, project-based language learning is also very closely related to the idea of learning engagement. Now, Learning engagement is multidimensional. So sometimes we can see students engage, you know, actively participated in a project. Uh, we know the quality of their project later on and see, we can see whether they gain something or retain information that they have gained from the project. We can see that they're eager to learn or they're connected with what they're doing, but 
if students are not doing project work with other people or in this case in groups, they may miss out on the social aspect of learning engagement, which is to connect, to share, communicate, collaborate, and learn with others. Now, why do we do pro 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 project based language learning? So often I uh, think about this and I always go back to Dale's kind of experience. As we can see here that when students are given the chance to do real thing, they actually remember more of the experience. So in project-based learning, students will be given the opportunity to do all of these things as well as the last one. Right, so why PBL? PBL will polish students' soft skills, like when you work in group and then you have to lead your group mates, then, then you learn to be a leader. They will also learn how to improve the, their digital literacy, especially when they work with technology in the project-based language learning. They will know better about the world, uh, better learning engagement and motivation, improve language knowledge and also proficiency. Learning will become more relevant to them, more exciting and useful rather than sitting in class doing what the, the book says they should do. And then the most important one is actually the cultivation of 21st century skills in which students are given the chance to communicate, collaborate and think critically and produce something creatively. So why using technology in BBL? The easiest answer to this question is because it's, it can be used to mediate communication, right? It's there, the technology is there. And for um, today, in today's condition, online learning, we need technology, otherwise we will not be able to, to learn anything because it makes projects more manageable because it provides authentic language input, because it can be used to record output, because it facilitates collaboration, because it supports creativity, and the list can go on and on and on. So technology is, well, to me, because I like working with technology, it's probably the way to go. And when it comes to pro, uh, project-based language learning, but, uh, technology can support this kind of approach. Now, some of the challenges, now, the challenges that I've listed on the left side, these are the challenges that students usually face, you know, like uh, they don't have motivation to learn or to work on a project because it's too difficult. They don't have the support, um, the level of digital literacy. So they do need help, varied level of engagement, personal relation with others. Um, in this era, when students are doing online learning, they do not really know their classmates. So it's actually quite different to work in groups in which you don't know everyone, the members of the, of the group. So experts suggest that in addition to doing project-based language learning, we do other activities with students so that they can know each other a little bit better and then start working on the project instead of just you know directly go to working on the project. And some students do not know how to plan and manage big things. And these are things that we can cultivate during project-based language learning. On the other side, we also have something which may be beyond our capacity to, to uh, overcome. So like digital divide, when we work with students, like 32 students in one classroom, sometimes we have half of the students who live in remote areas and they do not have reliable internet connection. So we have this digital divide that we need to deal with and consider when we do project-based language learning. And in Indonesian condition, we have rigid syllables, syllabus that will be quite difficult to tweak and fit into project-based language learning. Lack of support from schools and uh, colleagues and then for students, lack of feedback even to, to uh, sorry, from the teacher and from others and technical problems like this when my you know, next door neighbor is building a house. Now, how? How can technology support project-based language learning? I cannot say this you know, often enough, so I always bring this into my presentation. As with any technology, it's not the technology itself 
that enhances teaching and all learning, but rather the use to which it is put. And we will see that this idea being highlighted in the example that I will bring today. Now I'm going to give you one simple example that I do with my students in one of the courses that I teach here, which is a, project, a comic strip project. So the driving question behind this is that the context is um, extensive reading course. So after reading an interesting or not so interesting story, readers often want to change something about the story and they want to go with, they want to remember it in, uh, in a certain way, in their own way. And if they find that the story is not interesting enough, they want to put something in, you know, add more characters or things like that. So a project like creating comic strips will be able to help students do this then, um, overcome their, their problem there. Now, the project is actually creating digital comic strips based on a story. So I've listed here some of the use of technology in this particular uh, task, uh, sorry, project. So technology can be used for reading a digital book. So use ebook reader or online uh, library like X Reading. Uh, the next one, technology can be used for researching about the story and also about comic strips. Can be used for sharing files, for communicating with group mates, for creating digital comic strips and for sharing or presenting projects to be reviewed and commented by others. Now, we are going to like look into this project a little bit uh, closer by taking a look at this work plan. So as we see, we have seen before that project cannot be finished in just one sitting, you know, two hours. It would be quite, quite impossible for that. You may want to do task-based language learning instead of project-based language learning. So first, the first stage of this particular work plan is that students will find a story and some comic strips based on the story on the internet. And then after that, they can share the story and comic strips on Wiklet or, or uh, Padlet. So this is a technology that students can use to, to share documents. And then the next stage, they can discuss what they think of the story and the comic strips in groups. So they work on this, uh, this project in groups, they learn how to make comic strips. Not, not everyone can make comic strips. Uh, and creating comic strips, digital comic strips will need some, standard, some kind of skills. So students will, will need to be taught how to do that, or they can teach each other how to do this. And the next one, they read a story of their choice in groups again and design comic strips based on the story. After they finish designing the comic strip, they present the design to the class for feedback on the content. You can, we can also add feedback on the content and the language, but we need to be careful with our students because students get discouraged when they get too many comments or too much feedback yeah so start with content first and then focus on the language a little bit later so this particular stage of this project can be done in two stages so first of all focus on the content and then focus on the form meaning and then the form the next one students can start making the comic strips in groups they post the comic strips again on Padlet or Wiklet so that others can see and give comments on. And then they will start giving comments to other groups. And based on the comments, they can revise the comic strips. And finally, they can post the revised comic strips on Wiklet or Padlet. Once again, so after this kind of activity, students can do other things like, okay, vote for the best comic strip or something like that, make it interesting and challenging. Now, when we see the work plan, we can see that technology is a big part of this because in every single stage of this work plan, technology plays a role. So in finding comic strip, in finding stories and comic strips, students will need access to the internet and they will need to have uh, need 
to know how to use browsers. When they share, they will meet to know how to use these apps. When they discuss, they can talk um, in Zoom like here, like this, or if they can use simple messaging apps or chat apps to communicate with each other. When they learn how to make comic strips, digital ones, then they will need technology to help them with that. When they read, they can read uh, the digital version of stories. So that technology will also lend a hand. And then the design comic strips, this can be done uh, manually as well as in digital form. So similarly, in all of these stages, technology uh, supports project-based language learning. Now, to sum this up, technology can be used for brainstorming, you know, for sharing not only files, but also opinions and feedback. It can be used for practicing, reviewing, recalling. So if students need to, to record a podcast, for example, they have the chance to polish their pronunciation and find out a little bit more about uh, grammatical points or things like that. Now, technology can also be useful for resourcing and researching for information and input, and the list goes on again. You know, it can be useful for connecting people, collaborating with others, and creating and also managing projects. So the next time we want to do, or we want to employ project-based language learning, there may be questions that we want to ask ourselves. What is the driving question or problem? What are the learning outcomes that uh, authentic, hopefully authentic. What kinds, uh, what skills do students need to learn to complete the project? This is something that teachers often neglect. So we assume that our students are really good at, you know, creating pod, uh, videos or, or things like that. But do they know how to create good ones? We don't know. So this particular question should always be asked when we design a problem, a project-based language learning. The next one, what language skills are practiced and improved? We want to be able to cover everything from reading, listening, writing, and speaking. How long is the project going to be? How are the tasks going to be sequenced? How and when do learners need feedback? So we need to um, have some of the stages uh, designed as feedback giving kind of activity. And the next one, how and when are they going to be assessed and how and when technology is going to be used in that particular project. So thank you very much. If you want to download the PowerPoint of my presentation today, you can just scan the QR code on the screen now. Now, these are some of the references that I use for today and these are credits to those creating um, visuals for today's presentation. So thank you very much, Willy. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very insightful presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please give Dr. Francisca Yvonne a big round of applause. Clap, 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 clap. And also to Professor Rod Alice again. Clap, 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 clap. Uh, we have about 15 minutes or so for discussions, for questions. And I've seen a lot of questions from the, uh, from the audience. Uh, maybe I can start with one of the questions that I've seen uh, from the uh, Q&A box. And Ming, maybe you can follow up later with additional questions. Uh, yeah, one question uh, that keeps appearing is this. I mean, task-based, project-based learning often involve, doesn't have to, but often involve group activities, students working together, completing a task or completing a project. Now, a practical question that people often ask is this, how do, we, how do we form the group? Do we mix students together or do we just, you know, put the, uh, the uh, lower proficiency uh, students in one group and the higher proficiency students in another group, or do we just mix them? Uh, what do we know about this grouping thing from the, uh, from the professional literature? Uh, any one of you, Professor Rod Alice, uh, audio on, please. Okay. Uh, first of all, I, I do want to emphasize that although group work and pair work is something that is very important in task-based language teaching, 
Mm. It's not an essential feature. Okay. It's not what makes task-based language teaching. Mm. You know, I mean, if you remember Prabhu and yes. his project in India, yes, uh, he made a he made a, a a clear decision not to actually involve any pair work or group work. Right? Mm. Not that I'm saying he's right. Yeah. But neither project work nor task-based language teaching make group work essential. Okay. And I would argue that if you're dealing with very low proficiency learners, beginner level learners, mm. group work is not necessarily the best way to go ahead, right? Okay. That doesn't answer your question. I will now try and answer it, right? Yeah. Okay. I, I don't think there is a best way of organizing mm. groups. I think what teachers need to do is to experiment and to um, experiment with forming groups in different ways, such as groups with mixed proficiency, groups with the same proficiency, yeah. uh, mixed gender groups, etc., cetera, mm. and observe carefully the performance of these groups. And I think another thing that needs to be thought about in um, the use of collaborative teaching involving group work is whether you want to have the same groups all the time right. or whether you want to actually vary the group from one time to another, etc. I mm. would tend to favor the latter, at least initially, because it is one way in which you can experiment with mm. what seems to work with the best type of group matching. Mm. Uh, Dr. Francisca, do you, do you anything that you want to add? Yes. So I'm, I'm with Professor Ellis. So mm -hmm. we need to experiment because we don't know about our students enough to be able to, you know, give one mm -hmm. definite answer to this question. Like mm -hmm. different classes, they have yeah. different. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, atmosphere. You know, some students know and want to work with others better, and sometimes they don't. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so experimenting is uh, it's a good way and giving them the chance to, if we later on decide to, mm -hmm. to give them group work, giving them the chance to get to know each other is actually very important because these good days idea. students yeah. don't know each mm -hmm. other enough. Yeah, Yeah. good idea. Another question that appears very often in the, in the chat box is the uh, issue of feedback. Uh, Task-based, project-based language learning focus more on meaning and communicative outcome and things like that. To what extent we should also provide feedback on the language, the language element? Yeah, I go again. Yes, yes, please. Um, in my talk, I I did mention very briefly, but couldn't mm. really develop the notion of focus on form. Yes, and the main way in which you provide focus on form is through corrective feedback. Mm. And um, there's been a lot of research that's investigated what teachers actually do when students are doing tasks. And they do, in fact, a lot of corrective feedback, and they do it in a variety of ways. One way that I showed you was through what are called recasts, yeah. where you repeat an erroneous utterance by a student correcting the erroneous part. It's called a recast. Yeah. Right. And that's entirely compatible. But so are sometimes more explicit types of corrective feedback. Mm -hmm. So feedback plays an absolutely essential major role in task based language teaching. Um, the only other thing I would say is that um, the feedback can take place during the task mm -hmm. through corrective feedback, or it can take place after the task is finished when the teacher elects to go over various types of linguistic problems that he sees the students have been experiencing mm. and help them to see how to correct those problems, et cetera. Good. So yeah. feedback mm. is, is an essential feature mm. of task-based language teaching, mm. both in the sense of immediate feedback during the performance of a task and in the post-task stage where you can go over yeah and give feedback on various problems that you've seen. Mm, yes. Dr. Francisca, anything that you yeah. want to add? Yeah, so this is often seen as a, a problem from both sides. You know, from the teacher's uh, side, 
and then from the student side. So students often see, uh, often complain that teachers do not give me enough feedback, especially in the Asian context. They want to be given, you know, an approval like, oh, this is the correct one. This is not correct. So yeah, we should uh, spend time giving them bit, uh, feedback in within the, when they are actually doing the project. So the stages of after presenting, after discussing and things like that, there will be a time for teachers to give students feedback and students to receive feedback from other students. Um, and also yeah. at the end, yeah. Yeah, excellent. Min, did you see any interesting questions from the audience? Interesting yes. ones only. Yes, there is a question for both Professor Yvonne and Professor Ellis. And the question is, is it possible to combine task-based language teaching and project-based learning when we're designing a course? Wow, that's a big question. Yes. <laughs> Professor Ellis? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, project-based learning needn't purely be task-based. Mm -hmm. It can involve actually fairly traditional types of activities focusing mm. on specific language, et cetera, right? Yeah. Although in general, project-based language teaching will be mainly task-based and certainly the final outcome of the project is very likely to be a task, et cetera. Right. Yeah. So project-based teaching is one way of sequencing tasks. Uh, and that is going to raise the various issues that I discussed with regard to sequencing tasks. You have to think about what is an appropriate type of task to start with in terms of the student's level, et cetera, and how you can perhaps move from input-based tasks to output-based tasks in the course of doing the project, et cetera. Mm. So, you know, it, it, it seems to me there's, uh, they are absolutely entirely compatible, project-based and task-based. Mm -hmm. Of course, task-based language teaching does not have to be project-based. Right. You could basically have a separate task for every single lesson, right? Mm -hmm. And I can see some advantages in that. Mm -hmm. You know, project-based teaching is fine if students get really involved in the project. But, mm. you know, they don't always do that. Sometimes they get fed up with doing the same thing. And therefore, it seems to me that there is a case sometimes for um, just having single tasks, which a lesson is focused on, and then next lesson, another task, et cetera. Mm. Yes. There's another question yeah, so, here. Oh, sorry. Uh, Sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> it's okay. So, yeah, when, when uh, doing task-based language learning and project-based language learning, we actually have options. Like we don't have to do big things. Projects, they are small projects and they are big projects. They are small mm. tasks and they are big tasks. So by combining all of these things, then we can probably come up with, you know, several um, tasks and then one big project at the end. Because at the end of the day, when we do a project, we also do tasks. Mm. Mm. Yes. Next question, Min. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think Thank there's you. a question mm. that keeps coming up here yes. regarding the role of explicit teaching of grammar in task-based language teaching. And um, the question is, is there a danger that task-based language teaching does not lead to a significant development in the learners interlanguage? Is it possible that a pigeonized, pigeonized form of uh, L2 develops, fossilized by a focus on um, accomplishing the task rather than developing language abilities? Wow, that's a very technical question. <laughs> Rob, uh, <laughs> uh, Rob, okay, Professor it is Alex. a technical question, and it would really need another talk to deal with that question because yes. it is a question that is central to teachers mm -hmm thinking and doubts about task-based language teaching. Yeah. Um, this, this question is really motivated by um, the distinction between intentional learning and incidental learning. Right. Uh, teachers often feel happier 
if mm. they are engaging their students in intentional learning. That is to yes. say, they have a particular linguistic point that is the uh, aim of the lesson, the target of the lesson, and they teach to that point, including perhaps using a task, as in PPP, right? Mm. So teachers are likely very often to favor intentional learning. Mm. But as I said in my talk, there are limits to intentional learning. It doesn't necessarily involve in it lead to the kind of knowledge that you can use fluently in communication, mm. right? It doesn't actually help you to be communicative. Mm. And arguably, what you really need is opportunities for incidental language learning. Mm. But I, I have never been um, a purist TBLT person, never. Mm. I have always felt that mm. there is a case for what I call a modular curriculum, a mm. curriculum that includes opportunities for intentional language learning and more sort of task supported PPP type instruction, mm. right? Yeah. And also lots of opportunities for task based language teaching. Mm. But my experience of a lot of schools and places that I visited in Asia is that it's the task-based language teaching that is lacking. Mm. That, that teachers just have such a strong commitment to intentional language learning mm. and explicit language teaching that they do not really provide the opportunities that they need mm. for learners to do tasks, learn incidentally, mm. develop interactional competence mm. through developing and acquiring language. Right. Yeah. A follow up question to that to that, Rod, is 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 something to do with with the uh, distinction you made early on about input uh, based task and output based task, mm -hmm. which of the two, in your opinion, leads more to incidental uh, learning? Is it the uh, input based mm -hmm. task, output based task, based task or both? I, I don't think you can an answer that question. Because I think that both input-based tasks <clears throat> and output-based tasks do contribute to incidental learning, right? Mm -hmm. um, input-based tasks do have one advantage, which is that you can seed the tasks with mm -hmm. particular language that you want the learners to have a chance to acquire, have a chance to learn, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Whereas output-based tasks, you can't really control the actual True. output that students will be producing. True. But we know yeah. that when, we, when students do output-based tasks, they do have opportunities to produce new language forms. Right. They do have opportunities to um, improve their control over forms that they have already acquired, mm. etc. The mm. two senses of acquisition that mm. I talked about mm. uh, in, in my talk. So right. I, I don't think you yeah. can answer the question. Right. I think if you're, if, I, mm. I, I think that if you're thinking about developing a task-based course, then you must start off initially with input-based tasks. Right. Yeah. And you must gradually move to output-based tasks. And by the way, output-based tasks do not always have to be done in pairs and groups. Okay. Output-based tasks can still be done with the teacher and the whole class. Mm. Mm. We've got today with us uh, Professor Rob Waring uh, from Japan. I, I wonder if, 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 if he would, you know, you. he would love to provide a perspective on, you know, task-based language teaching or project-based language teaching or input-based learning or output-based learning. Rob, if you feel like saying anything, providing a perspective, go ahead. Otherwise, um, no. I, I don't have any yeah. particular perspective. I do have a question yeah. though. Um, in terms of the career of a student, um, when what sort of knowledge needs to be in place for task-based learning and project-based learning to take on? Obviously, you can't do it from day one. What do you need to do no. to build up language? Mm. What sort of tasks do you need to do? What sort no. of things do you need to do before you can move to a more, how shall I say, uh, a, a stage of learning where more task-based and project-based work might take over. What would you suggest people do at a very early level? 
Rob, I would have to dispute your premise. Okay. I think, I think that you can start. I think you can start with complete beginners. Mm. And I suggest you go and look at the work of Natsuko Shintani. Because he was teaching six-year-old Japanese children who knew not a single word of English. And she was beginning with task-based language teaching and actually carried out a comparison between what they learned with task-based language teaching and what they learned with a more traditional type of PPP approach, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I, mean, I just have to dispute your premise. <laughs> I think the reason that that assumption that, that underlies your comment is so common is because <laughs> people think that task-based yes. language teaching must necessarily involve production-based tasks, output-based mm -hmm. tasks, speaking tasks. Mm -hmm. But what Shintani did was to start entirely with input-based tasks. Mm. And input-based yeah. tasks do not actually prevent students from speaking because mm. they do speak when they're yeah. struggling to do the task with the teacher. They do speak initially in their L1 because they don't have any English. Mm. But gradually, they start to move, to switch from using L1 to using a little bit of English. So my answer to your question is we can do it with beginners, mm. but you've got to design a task. You've got to design a set of tasks that are mm. compatible with how language learning starts. Mm. And it starts by listening to input, relating mm. input to what you can see, and learning vocabulary in particular, because Shintani's study is actually mainly focused on vocabulary, right? Mm. Yeah. Uh, by picking it up, incidentally, through the process of doing the tasks. Hmm. I think uh, if I yeah. rephrase your question to a question that I would ask, and I don't think has been properly addressed in the field hmm. of task-based language teaching, which is how do you move from the kinds of tasks that Shintani did with hmm. these complete beginners, very young children, to output-based tasks involving pair work and group work? Right. Mm -hmm. She does talk a little bit about that in her book, but um, I think it is an issue which is not being properly developed and thought out in task-based language teaching. Mm. Yeah, very good. Uh, a really good question. Now, this one is for both uh, Francisca and also uh, for Professor Alice. Uh, translanguaging. I mean, that's a big word. That's a big, you know discussion going on at the moment about translanguaging, to what extent we allow students to sort of make use of whatever linguistic resources they have, maybe L1, L2, L3, or in, in, in multilingual context, students may have, you know, a very rich linguistic repertoire. Are we, are we allowing the students to use this? Are we not then, you know, uh, shortchanging our students when we allow the students to use a variety of languages to express themselves? Uh, your thought, please, Francisca. Yeah. Okay. Francisca. Yeah, we should allow students to use yes. any language that they have because mm. um, we do not want to make task-based language learning and project-based language learning <sighs> too complicated. Mm. And probably yeah. by allowing them to, for example, when we have beginners, they may not use the second language to, to communicate with each other. So they can use their first language, but the mm. input can be in the in the second language, sorry, they can talk to each other in their first language, but the input can be in the, in the second language. And they will right. gradually be able to build on what they, they have hmm. by you know, starting to, to move from a, a first language to a second language used later on when they are ready. Yeah. Hmm. Rod? Oh, I, I think this is a very interesting question. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna say something a little bit more controversial to start with. I mean, th there is a rich literature on the use of the L1 yes. in the L2 classroom, right? Mm. And um, in part, that literature was concerned with the fact that um, the use of the L1 in the foreign language classroom is sort of frowned on and should be yes. limited, et cetera, right? Yes. yes. Now we talk about translanguaging, which, of course, has all positive associations right right uh, no yes. negative association nope, nothing at all <laughs> nothing i don't accept that <laughs> i think that translanguaging 
I mean, translanguaging is what I saw in Shintana's data. You know, yeah, they were using L1 and then the bit of English and then a mixture of the two, right? Mm. Where, and she was as well, though primarily she was actually using English in her input, mm. et cetera. But she did use some Japanese as well. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, translanguaging was going on. Yes. But, yeah. but excessive translanguaging mm. is no better than excessive use of the L1. Agree. Used to Good be point. When we talk Excellent. About that, yeah. Good point. Yes. So yes. you know, we don't don't let's be fooled by all the positive associations <laughs> of trans language. Let's look at it critically. Let's yes. ask ourselves what constitutes appropriate, mm. good functional use mm. of whatever linguistic resources learners have in the yeah. classroom. I like your point. Uh, in fact, at the moment, I'm editing a special issue for a journal on translanguaging, and I'm going to invite you to write an, you know, a very short comment on, on that volume, Brad. You can do that. Uh, yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have here with us uh, my co-moderator, Professor Nguyen Thit Thuy Ming, who is an expert on the teaching of pragmatics, the importance of you know, teaching not only the language, but also how students can use the language uh, appropriately uh, in a way that is culturally relevant and things like that. Uh, is task-based language teaching pretty much in line with the idea that we should also teach our students how to communicate appropriately in a way that is culturally, you know, uh, relevant and all that? I, I think that's that a very in? interesting question, yeah. which I've sort of been thinking about a little bit. Um, a, a lot of... Um, a lot of tasks really involve what you could call referential language use. Mm. In fact, there was a, uh, a book that was produced uh, called Referential Language Communicative Task, etc. Because most of communicative tasks are referential. They involve mm. um, exchange of information. Uh, right. They involve exchange of opinions, etc. Right? Yes. And... You know, to what are there tasks that help people to learn to request in polite ways, mm. that learn uh, how to apologize in, bright, in polite ways? Yeah. Well, there are, uh, because one type of task, which I think has not been really seen as central to task based language teaching, but should be seen as more central, uh, are role play tasks. Mm because role-play tasks will meet my four criteria, and these can be designed to help them deal uh, with a whole variety of different types of speech acts, which is basically to a large extent what pragmatics is about, right? Mm. Yes. Um, so I, I think there's definitely a gap there mm. in task-based language teaching, but there needn't be. I, mm. The other thing I would point out is that, of course, in opinion back tasks performed in groups, mm. Learners mm -hmm. do have to uh, perform a variety of speech acts. They have to agree, right. disagree, mm -hmm. etc. Right. And in yeah. his own research, looked at writing tasks uh, mm -hmm. and, and involved in using those tasks to investigate agreement and disagreement amongst mm -hmm. language learners. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, Thank you. To, Min, to yes, add, please. I mean, to add to what Professor Ellis had just said, um, there's a new book. Not really new, but you know, it was published in 2019, um, edited by Professor Taguchi, uh, you know, on task-based teaching in pragmatics. Oh, nice. Task-based yeah. yeah. task teaching in pragmatics has been quite new because mm. you know it, it is a tradition in pragmatics to use explicit, explicit um, you know, protest to teach um, speech acts. So um, mm. yeah, I mean, it's very interesting, and uh, mm. yeah. We please, definitely look forward to it. Yes. Please send, me, please send me the reference. Sure, I'll, I'll do okay. that. Yes. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we are coming to the end of today's session. Perhaps if I could invite both uh, Francisca and Professor Alice to just give one piece of advice to the audience in relation to task-based language teaching and also project-based language learning. Uh, any closing statement, any piece of advice that you would like to give the audience today? Francisca, do you want to go first? Okay. Uh, yeah, so 
to me, it's just give it a try, but not as a full blown, you know, activity. You know, give it a try by trying uh, to do small and short kind of project based language learning and see whether your students or our students are responding well to this kind of um, approach. Because in Indonesia and in Southeast Asia, we see that we have really, really rigid curriculum that will not you know, allow us to do something very, uh, something big. Yeah, but at university level, we probably have more chance to, to work with project-based language learning as well as class-based language learning. Mm. Yes, Rod? Yeah, in, in a way, my idea was much the same. I know that teachers feel constrained to continue to engage in explicit language teaching, catering to intentional language learning. And, you know, my advice to them is um, task-based language teaching, you don't have to make a complete switch from intentional learning to task-based language learning. Um, you could simply say, okay, what I'm going to do this semester is set aside 10 minutes in a lesson when I will choose a task and get my students and do that task with my students or get my students to do the task. You know, just, just be prepared to set aside a little small proportion of the lesson mm. to, to try out task-based language teaching. Yeah. Good advice. Thank you again, Professor Rod Ellis and Professor Francisca Maria Yvonne, and also my special Thank guest you. today, Professor Rod Waring, and my co-moderator, Professor Noentit Tuiming. Ladies and gentlemen, it now gives me a great pleasure to end today's session. And uh, for those of you who are interested in getting a certificate, please fill in the form, be a survey form. And at the end of it, you'll be able to download the e-certificate plus the uh, PowerPoint slides of today's presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And don't forget next week, we have another very, very exciting session is on teaching writing and we have very good speakers, excellent speakers. Uh, the first one is Professor Ken Highland from the UK, and he's, he's, been, he's, he's written a lot of uh, books and uh, research articles on writing. And the other person, uh, Professor I.C. Lee from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, she has also done a lot of uh, research on uh, how to teach writing, how to give feedback to our students. I'll be seeing you again next week. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Rod. Thank you, Professor Francisca, okay. Maria, Yvonne. Thank, bye -bye, you bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. Thank you.